Well, a very good morning to everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, so this is a series of uh, uh, four webinars, um, which we are giving uh, with the theme, essential information, COVID-19 essential information for vets. And my name is Chris Ora, and I'm from the uh, School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of the West Indies. So I guess first gave this talk on the 9th of April, but I revised it for this recording on the 20th of April. So what we'll have uh, for this uh, webinar, there will be uh, four different um, webinars. Uh, the first I'm going to be giving, which is related to the risks from emerging, I'm going to give information on the risks from emerging viruses from animals and the current hot topics related to COVID-19. Then my colleague Janine Sitahel is going to talk about the origins of uh, COVID-19 virus. Um, and then we're going to have Kamara Rind, who's going to be talking about um, potential role for wild and domestic animals in the spread. And then finally, Patricia Bedford from FAO, who's going to talk on recommendations for vets in practice. So I have to say at this stage um, that obviously we all know that things are moving very fast in this area. Um, so uh, when you see this video, obviously things might have changed, but I do implore you to get information from trusted sites if you are going to get information, like the WHO, the CDC. So we have a lot of viruses that are appearing um, over the last 20 years, um, and you can see the picture of them here, and I, I hope you can see my, um, my mouse. Um, all the way from dengue to HIV to SARS to MERS to chikungunya to Ebola to Zika. We've had many of these viruses in the Caribbean and across the world. And the, what I always ask my students in this question is what do all these viruses have in common? And this is the fact that they've come from animals. And many, many viruses that we're seeing, in fact, around 75% of new and emerging viruses in humans have come from animals. And this is an area we really need to look at very carefully because it's going to continue. And here we see another one, COVID-19. In this box on the bottom right here, we see a question mark usually. And I usually think it's going to be influenza that actually goes into this as the next uh, virus. But in fact, it's this new, it's this new one, COVID-19, which is similar to SARS and MERS. So when a new virus appears in a population, there's many things that we need to do rapidly and have been doing rapidly to try to understand the virus itself, because every virus is different. We have to understand the host immune response, how the host responds to the virus, how long that immune system will be, how effective, how protective that immune system will be. We have to happen to understand how viruses are transmitted because viruses are transmitted in very different ways. And that if this affects how easily they will spread through a population, how they will spread through the population and how we will try to stop them. We also have to stand, understand the reservoirs of infection, how these viruses may be hiding in uh, animal reservoirs. Um, because, of course, if they're in animal reservoirs, there's always a risk they will come, again, come out again and infect us. Vaccine availability is, of course, really important. We've seen this with this COVID and we also saw it with Ebola. Um, whether there are vaccines there and how quickly and easily it will be to uh, actually produce a vaccine. And we're in this situation at the moment. And also from the point of health systems, we're seeing how different um, efficiencies of health systems are affecting how easily or difficult it is to control uh, a virus like this and how many deaths might ensue. So this is the virus itself. Um, many people have seen this. It's a very uh, pretty virus, which has these projections on the outer coat of the virus here. Um, and these are the spike protein, which you'll hear more about here. And this is the protein that interacts with cells because a virus needs a live cell uh, in order to replicate. So these are like the keys on the surface of a virus that enter the lock of the virus. And we know the lock, the lock of the cell, which is the receptor of the cell. And it's an interaction with this lock and this key, which then opens up the cell, opens up the door, lets the virus in, and the virus then replicates in the cell and often kills the cell and causes damage to the cell. And we know this key, this key, we know this uh, surface protein, this spike protein, and we also know the receptor, which we'll hear about later, the ACE receptor, which is the receptor on the surface of cells that are infected by the virus. 
So we know the situation of this virus now uh, is very severe, and this is the 19th of April, and these are the cases that happened in the last week, and the darker the, the, darker the blue, the more cases. And as we know, it's all around the world. And we also know, and you can get very nice information from the WHO situation reports on this, that the virus is um, spreading dramatically in the red, uh, as you can see in the red bar charts here, um, that's in Europe, and the brown bar charts here, and that's in the Americas. But the one good thing we can see here is in recent weeks, this curve, this peak is flattening, and that's because of all the things that we're doing. Um, to try to stop and delay the spread of this virus. So this is good news. We all know about the clinical signs. We've heard about these, fever, dry cough, fatigue. And we all know about the incubation period, which is usually around uh, four to six days, but can be up to 15 days. That's the time from virus infection to the time you start showing clinical signs. And we also all know that around 80% of people who are infected this virus with this virus are only going to have um, quite mild or moderate symptoms. They're not going to need um, hospitalization. However, the problem with this virus is around 20% of the people um, are going to get more severe clinical signs. And around 5% of these are going to need um, hospital care, emergency care, oxygen and intensive care. And this is why we're having the problems, because this 5% is a lot of people when you've got a lot of people infected at the same time. Um, and those are in danger of, um, of overcrowding and overwhelming our hospitals and our health systems. And that's where we're trying to flatten the curve and we're trying to stop um, or slow the spread of this virus so we don't have our health systems completely inundated. Many of you have heard that um, there are certain types of people that are more susceptible to the severe consequences of this virus. Um, we know that older people, as you can see in these figures on the left here, especially in the red, older people, uh, especially above 70, are more susceptible. And then it reduces with younger people being very uh, low susceptibility to the severe effects of this virus. That doesn't mean they're not getting the virus. It doesn't mean they're not transmitting the virus. But when they do get the virus, they have less severe symptoms. And we also know that certain comorbidities, health conditions, chronic conditions are contributing towards more severe manifestations of this virus, including cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, respiratory disease, hypertension. And we know that, uh, that males uh, look to, uh, so they might be more susceptible to the severe, uh, to this disease than females. This was some inter interesting data that was right at the start in Italy that showed um, in the first of around 1,235 people that died of the virus, only one person was actually under 40. And this really shows you uh, the susceptibility or the, the seriousness of this virus um, in older people. And that's why we hear about people, older people dying in large amounts, I'm afraid, uh, in, in care homes uh, around the world. How bad is this virus? Well, um, there's been a lot of debate about this, with it starting having a case fatality, which is the, the number of people um, who die compared to the number of people who've been infected with the virus. Um, so this is a percentage figure, and the denominator is so important here. That's the number of people who've been infected with the virus. And this is changing as we learn more about the virus. So the case fatality started at around nearly 6% in Wuhan. And then when they got themselves together in China, got 40,000 people in hospitals, they reduced this to 0.7%. And critically, that was when they included increased the testing as well. And we've seen many different case fatalities in different countries. For example, in Europe, where Germany um, have a low case fatality of around 1% to 2%. Um, whereas other countries like Italy, Spain, and the UK seem to have a high case fatality. And this is um, why this case fatality is different depends on a lot of different factors. And that would be the availability of appropriate healthcare. Obviously, if people were, if there isn't the healthcare available, more people are going to die. The population age structure, as we said, more older people are going to die. So more older populations, like possibly in Italy, the older, the elderly people are going to, going to die. 
general uh, population health and incidence of comorbidities because that is a risk factor uh, as I explained earlier if you have more of these comorbidities you're going to get more people in that high risk factor Testing, testing, testing is critical because the denominator increases due to testing. And we know now, as we're learning more about this, about this virus, there are more asymptomatic and mild cases than we originally thought. And this may be a large, uh, quite a large amount. And when you test and you put into the equation these asymptomatic and mild cases, you increase the denominator. So you're dividing your deaths by a much larger figure. So your case fatality is going down. And that's what we're seeing now. We're also seeing it when we're initiating antibody testing which is showing that uh, people that have been infected with the virus. Um, and we're seeing that many more people, such as in Iceland and various other studies, are actually have actually been infected with the virus and haven't shown any or, or mild clinical signs that they haven't been tested. So the case fatality is coming right down. And also the efficiency of public health initiatives. Tracing is so important once you get positive tests, how you're able to trace that and quarantine people who have been in contact with positive um, samples uh, and you can you can catch people early and you can treat them early so the efficiency of public health in initiatives is also affecting the case fatality. The other important question that we need to address is uh, how this virus is being transmitted. Um, there's been a lot of um, debate about this um, and there is information coming out all the time some of it's not peer-reviewed so we have to be a little bit careful about how we um, how we interpret this kind of data. But basically this virus is a respiratory virus that is largely spread through respiratory droplets. When we speak, when we cough, when we sneeze, especially those droplets are released. Those droplets then travel a certain distance and then they, then they move to the ground because they're on the whole larger droplets, they're heavy, so they move to, the, to a surface. Um, so there's a lot of work being done on this at the moment. And in some cases, um, we're seeing evidence for aerosolized virus, especially in cases where there's non-intensive ventilation or, or um, a tracheostomy and, and, and situations are being, um, procedures are being carried out where you actually get aerosol of the, aerosolization of the virus. So here we have a more high risk situation, such as in some hospital environments where you do see some airborne spread. But there's no evidence, uh, extensive evidence at the moment for airborne spread of this virus. Uh, although droplets, there are different sizes of droplets, and there are small droplets and large droplets, and smaller droplets might stay in the air for a bit longer. The virus associated with, associates with these droplets. So it's either transmitted directly into somebody's mucous membranes, mouth, nose, uh, or, or, or eyes, through a direct sneezing or coughing or speaking from the droplets or it can be transported from somebody's um, sneeze or cough uh, to a surface and then somebody else touches the surface and they take the virus up uh, and they infect themselves. So both direct and indirect. And it's not transmitted by droplet nuclei when the virus actually actually dries into a, dro a dry droplet nuclei. And these are very, very small and they can be transmitted in the air long distances. As we know in the veterinary world with foot and mouth disease, which can be traveled many, many, which can be blown many kilometers in droplet nuclei, nuclei form, the virus survives that and then is rehydrated when it enters a mucous membrane of a susceptible animal and it infects that animal if sufficient virus is there. That's not happening with this COVID-19. It's more of a, a direct contact. And that's why we need to socially distance uh, or physically distance. That's why we have this two meters. So we don't come into, come into contact with the, uh, with the droplets that have been sneezed or coughed or spoken out. Um, and critically, because I said these droplets then go on surfaces, we need to understand um, uh, how long the virus survives on these surfaces. And this is an envelope virus, so it has like a coat on it. And these envelope viruses are much more sensitive to the environment, environmental conditions than other types of viruses which don't have a coat on them. So this is good. So this is a pretty sensitive virus. It's easily killed by most household detergents, as we know, and alcohol levels, especially 60, 70 percent, and soap. Um, in the lipid in the soap interacts with the lipid in the membrane, in the coat, and once the membrane's dissociated, uh, the virus is inactivated. So there are quite a few different um, uh, 
there are quite a few different studies showing how long, experimental studies showing how long this virus might be present on, on surfaces. And basically it's from a few hours to a few days. And it will depend on the surface and it will depend on the environmental conditions, the temperature, the humidity, etc. So the bottom line is that COVID-19 may survive on surfaces for a couple of days, from hours to a couple of days, but you can kill it through standard surface disinfectants, which is good. And we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about uh, these areas. So from all this, we, 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 we need, we're understanding you know, the key things that we need to do. And we all know these, washing our hands regularly, because this kills the virus. Avoiding touching our mouth, nose and eyes because this is the mucous membranes that the virus needs to get into to infect us. Disinfect surfaces because the virus might be on surfaces and it's easily disinfected. Physical distancing two meters apart because of this droplet infection. The, the majority the, the droplets um, don't travel for more than that distance. Self-isolation, obviously, if you're sick or your family is sick, don't go out because you're going to be transmitting the virus. Try and catch a cough and a cold, a sneeze, because these droplets are going to transmit others. Don't visit health centers, doctors and hospitals. Um, if you've got clinical signs, call and get help from helplines, get advice from helplines. Support, as we've heard, the elderly and people with underlying health conditions so they avoid infections. These should be, people should be isolated. Potentially masks should be, should be worn by them and by the people caring for them. So we maximize, we maximize the chances that they don't get infected. And we all, we're all in this together, so we shouldn't panic by. So just to finish off, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the areas, and they'll come up in questions, I'm sure, that, uh, that, that have come up in some of the questions um, uh, that are sort of a little bit unknown at the moment. And there are many trials and studies being published at the moment. We have to be absolutely sure that these have been peer-reviewed, um, because that is the process whereby we really underlie, we really understand that these, these, these studies have been done properly and the peer review scientific community um, have accepted them as being, um, as being bona fide proper studies. So there's a lot of uh, talk about how long, lo lo long the immunity lasts for. And we know from other um, coronaviruses that um, immunity can be not that long, but um, well, it's usually for a month or at least hopefully a year, but then it does reduce um, often in natural infection. So we have to learn more about how long this immunity will last for, how long antibodies will last for, and how long and how effective protection will be um, uh, after people are infected. But it's likely to be a reasonable uh, length of immunity. But the jury is out a little bit at the moment. Can people get reinfected with the virus? I think uh, this is maybe a year later, yes, but soon after they've been infected, I think this is unlikely, or there have been some reports, but this could be due to testing anomalies or sampling anomalies. More likely than that people soon after they've been infected are going to be susceptible again. I think that's unlikely. Will the virus mutate and invade any vaccines? Again, these viruses do mutate, but not significantly, not like um, influenza virus. Um, so I think it's very unlikely that this virus, although it will mutate, I think it's unlikely that that mutation will change what we call its phenotype or its behavior and make it able to evade vaccines. So that's good news. How long will vaccines take to produce? Well, this is, the, this is a big question. They will probably take at least another 12 months, they have to be um, uh, um, have to be 100% sure that they are safe and effective. But I really think that the vaccines will be able to be produced by coronaviruses. Um, we have vaccines to other um, animal coronaviruses, and they're effective. We know the viruses, we know the um, uh, the proteins that are immunogenic that we need to that we need to add um, use to make viruses. So I think um, the prospects are very good of having um, a, a, an effective vaccine against this coronavirus uh, within the next 12 months. Fingers crossed. I think uh, about, anti what about antivirals? Yes, there's a lot of studies being carried out on a lot of different uh, potential, um, potentially antiviral drugs. And hopefully we'll hear about that more about this soon. But we have to be very, very careful that these studies are done properly and they have uh, control groups in them because many, many of the studies are being done without control groups. 
Can convalescent sera be used for treatment? Again, there's some positive trials that seem to be carried out with Ebola virus. This was very effective, and it may be effective um, uh, with, um, with COVID-19 as well, but we need to watch that space and look at the peer-reviewed articles that are coming out. Finally, this is what we're all trying to do. In many countries around the world, we're trying to flatten this curve so we don't get a, a, a massive amount of infections at the same time uh, which inundates our health systems and so many people are dying unnecessarily. So we're flattening this curve and that's why we're making the behavior changes we do at the moment. And there is a big debate about this, and there was a big debate about it, and there will continue to be a big debate about this as we move forward, because obviously flattening the, the, flattening the curve makes the, um, uh, makes the epidemic or the pandemic last a lot longer. Um, and we all know that uh, in order for these, a virus to pass through a population, it reaches, uh, when it infects a certain percentage of the population, you get this thing called herd immunity. And that's around 70, 80% of the population. And this is a point at which the virus can no longer spread in the population because the majority of people are immune. Um, so the virus stops at that stage. Um, and so there were quite a lot of, of, of debates about at the start about whether we should let this virus go through the population in the process trying to protect the most susceptible groups of the population, the elderly and the people with, with um, uh, underlying mortality, such as you can see on the right of this um, slide here. However, if you do this, uh, you, so you, you have a shorter epidemic, less social and economic consequences, which will be come to the fore as we look towards our exit strategies and we'll be back to normality more quickly. However, this is not easy. It's not easy to control a virus in this way. The virus could spread well out of control uh, and we could see many, many um, people dying. Um, and these you know, would be very, very uh, severe over um, inundation of our health systems, which would cause issues. So most people at the moment are on the side of against herd immunity because we're delaying the epidemic and this saves lives. Um, and doesn't put the pressure on our health systems. And I can completely understand why this is the case. However, as I said just now, you get a longer epidemic period leading to possibly waves of infection, maybe only two or 3% of the population might be infected and then you stop it. But there's other countries with, in different stages of infection where people, uh, if you're going to open your borders, people are likely to come in. And of course you're in danger of having another wave of infection there. So you won't probably reach herd immunity, or it will take a long time to reach herd immunity in this case. Um, but uh, 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 if we get vaccines uh, within the next 12 months, we would have to keep behavioral changes going on until we get vaccines, because herd immunity won't be reached. And it is challenging um, going forward. Um, uh, we're going to see a lot of pressure uh, from people, from eco economists, um, saying that we should uh, open our borders, but then we have put our populations at risk. So we need to be extremely efficient about how we move forward. We need to move forward as a global community. There's obviously a need for very high levels of testing. So immediately in these situations, we get positive people coming in, uh, they can be tested uh, and then they can be quarantined and their family can be quarantined. So we see already mobile tracing apps being used. Um, uh, we will probably need to continue some level of behavioral change, maybe masks, and maybe as we get more antibody testing um, uh, initiated, uh, people who are recovered uh, hopefully will, we will be able to conclude that they're protected and they will be able to travel freely. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, there's a few messages here for what we're all doing at the moment. We need to all work together to get through this. It's not going to be easy and there's going to be a lot of debates along the way. So I'd like to, I'd like to in the next five, ten minutes, address some questions that were brought up at the, um, uh, at the seminar uh, by various people. Um, and I selected out some of these questions just so I could answer. So, uh, and I have addressed some of these questions in the talk. So the first one is, can the serum of recovered people be used for immunization of sick uh, people in, a, in this pandemic? As I think I mentioned, actually, um, yes, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of people looking into this at the moment. And there is some hope that the anti serum with antibodies, protective antibodies in it can be given to very sick patients and it might help. We need to watch that space. Uh, 
What about the experience uh, in animal diseases? As many uh, like these, avian bronchitis, where there are good vaccines um, for animal diseases, can that help? And the answer to that is very much yes. We know the immunogenic parts of the virus. We know what types of vaccines would be used in animals, so we can bring that information um, to help us to develop effective vaccines against humans. And that's exactly what's being doing, what we're doing at the moment. What about mutations of the virus and the reinfections of people? As I said earlier, mutations of the virus are occurring all the time, but uh, uh, understanding how other coronaviruses mutate and having this information, with the, it's unlikely that the virus will mutate to change itself so it becomes uh, not protected. Uh, changes to a to significant extent so it becomes um, uh, it evades the immune system, becomes like a new virus in the population. This is unlikely to happen with coronaviruses, like it could ha happen much more easier with influenza viruses. Does infection cause lifetime immunity? Probably not with coronaviruses. Um, uh, they don't have a particularly long level of immunity, maybe uh, a year or a little bit more than a year, but then, um, uh, then it reduces. Um, but we have to wait and see. Um, whether that's the case. Has COVID-19 mutated since the first outbreak? Yes, uh, only, but only in, on, a, on a minor level, not really affecting it, as I said earlier, but we are able to track the virus as it spreads by full genome sequences, uh, and as it mutates, we're able to track it from place to place. So is it worth creating a vaccine, or will this coronavirus always be with us like influenza viruses? Yes, it's worth creating a vaccine, um, because I think that will be effective. However, this virus might be with us, with us and it might join us as a seasonal virus uh, for many years to come. And we might have to take a coronavirus vaccine every year along with our influenza vaccines. What would be the strategy which protein to target to develop an effective and long lasting vaccine? Well, many of the vaccine studies now are using that spike protein that I talked about earlier. This is the immunogenic protein. And they're taking the, the genetic sequence of the spike protein out and they're putting it into a, um, another virus like an adenovirus, which is able to express that protein when, it, when it's put in vaccine form into a person. And it expresses that protein at very high levels, actually higher levels than natural infection. So it's very, very efficient at expressing that protein when you vaccinate it. And it's that protein that we hope will produce a very effective immune response. Um, so uh, I, I hope that um, um, we will have a vaccine based on the spike protein uh, within the next 12 months. <clears throat> Are the recovered COVID-19 patients being retested to affirmatively confirm that they have fully recovered and are no longer able to, to be contagious. Yes, in many cases, uh, there is testing going on of uh, people, hospitalized patients, and until they get negative, two negative tests sometimes, they're not allowed out. But obviously, when in countries where there's a lot of circulation going on, um, this is not the case. Um, considering there are some asymptomatic persons or carriers and the testing potential of many countries, um, how will this affect the aspects of flattening the curve? This is a really critical thing because we know there is a high percentage of asymptomatic and mild cases that haven't been tested. Um, and these asymptomatic cases especially are still likely to be able to transmit the virus from person to person. So sometimes we don't know whether a person or a person doesn't know whether they're infectious or not. And this obviously will have an effect on the spread of the virus. Um, the more asymptomatic unknown infectious patients that you have who don't know they're uh, are going out and don't know they've got the virus, the more likely it is to spread uh, and the more challenging it is, it is going to be to flatten the curve. What is known about virus circulation multiplication inside the human body? We know quite a lot about this virus. I talked about the, uh, the keys and the locks and the receptors. We know that the receptor of the virus is this ACE receptor. We know there's ACE receptors on many different host cells, including in our upper, upper respiratory tract, our lower respiratory, respiratory tracts, and in our guts. Um, and we know that younger people have less ACE receptors. As you grow older, you get more ACE receptors. We know that men have more ACE receptors, and this is probably the reason why this virus is causing more problems in older patients and in men. And we know this virus circulates um, in, in these cells, and when viruses circulate and replicate in these cells and cause damage to these cells, 
depending on where the cells are, you get the problems like upper respiratory tract, pneumonia, diarrhea, that reflects where the virus is replicating. And finally, uh, final questions. People with high uh, viral loads more prone to severe infection. We think this is probably the case. We've seen in health workers, maybe where they're infected with higher loads, they might be, get more severe disease, but more work needs to be done to look at viral loads both, um, both throughout infection to see how significant viral load is in, 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 in contributing to um, the severity of the disease. And then there were some questions on um, herd immunity. Um, having learned from other reasons, there was a race, uh, the nations, there was a race against time before community spread takes place, and many countries are flattening the curve to keep their morbidity and mortality rate, rates at a minimum. However, isn't it ideal such a big situation for countries in the world to develop herd immunity against COVID-19? This is necessary before travel industry can function. This is really important in the Caribbean, and what will it cost? Uh, this is a really critical area, and, and we're going to be talking about this a lot because the consequences, the economic consequences and social consequences of this virus um, and the way we're, uh, we're um, uh, responding to it at the moment um, uh, are all going to come to the fore because uh, especially the economic consequences, how long can we afford to keep our borders shut? However, if we open our borders, we open the doors to the virus. So um, there's a lot of debate uh, uh, around this at the moment. Uh, what, what's, worth, what's worse, the economic consequences um, of keeping our borders shut and what will, how that will affect people, or opening up the borders and letting the virus in and letting people become infected and reaching herd immunity. Um, so there's a lot of debate here. What are the transmission dynamics of COVID-19 under environmental temperatures? This is a big question. Um, uh, we, we know that viruses tend to dislike higher temperatures. We know that COVID-19 is killed at 56 degrees for 15 minutes, and it won't be as happy in, envir in higher environmental temperatures. But whether this virus is going to be transmitting uh, less efficiently in some of the tropical islands than some of the northern hemisphere, more uh, colder islands, we wait and see. Um, um, on whether it will become a seasonal virus that only comes out in the in the winter months after it's gone through this first uh, year, um, we will see, but it's difficult to say. But on the whole, viruses, yes, they do are susceptible to environmental temperatures, humidity, and, they, um, and, and, and under some circumstances, these temperatures can reduce the spread of these viruses. And finally, are there, is there any evidence that COVID-19 cases are being transmitted by vectors like flies, insects, and mosquitoes? The answer to this is no. Um, the, uh, the, the, these insects, these arboviruses, they transmit um, viruses through blood. Uh, and this COVID-19 is only present in the blood very, very short time. It's present in our respiratory tracts and in our, feet, in our alimentary tracts. Um, so it's extremely unlikely that this virus will be transmitted um, through blood-borne flies, insects, and mosquitoes. So that comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope that uh, this has answered some of the questions and I hope it uh, was useful. Thank you very much.